Thank you, my friend. This evening we're going to deal with part two of They Have Made Void Thy Law. You will remember that in the first one we set the general pace and we looked at the inversion of Genesis 1 and we looked at the basis for the morality of changing the law. And we saw that the papacy had natural law theory as the basis for its so-called reason to change God's law, which God says in his word is immutable and unchangeable. So this is quite an interesting thing. Now, if you think about the war between good and evil, then it is obvious that Satan hates everything about God. And particularly, he hates God's law. Because that is why he was driven from heaven. Surely, he was driven from heaven for disobedience and for disregard to God's law. And he has tried to instill that in mankind ever since. And if you go into the occult and Satanism, which is directly the worship of, of Lucifer, then do what thou wilt is the whole of the law is their common practice. The law of God must be negated and the law of chaos placed in its place. Now, Satan hates God's law and so tonight we want to look at God's law. We know that Roman Catholicism changed it but he wants to negate it completely. Psalms 119 verse 126, you remember it said, It is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void thy law. So when is God going to react? When his law is made void. So maybe it would be interesting to see how far down the line are we when it comes to the negation of God's law? Isaiah 24 verse 5, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. For 6,000 years we've had this morality on this planet, at least in some form or fashion, and now all of a sudden everything must be turned topsy-turvy. So I want to go through the Ten Commandments tonight and see what they have done to the law of God. Now, the Bible says, when they have made void thy law, does this mean that people have a disregard for that law? No, well then the end should have come long ago because people have disregard for God's law no matter whether, where you are. This obviously means when they officially remove God's law from society, then God will act. In other words, if legislation comes into conflict with God's law, then we have a problem. We are encouraged to obey the civil powers, and uh, that is good citizenship. But when civil power comes into conflict with God's law, then God's law is higher than civil power. Where do we have examples of this in the Bible? Well, all through the Bible. Let's, let's take the classic examples. Nebuchadnezzar makes a law and he says, You will bow down. And what did Daniel's three friends have to say to that? Our God is able to save us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down. Why not? Because there's a commandment which says, Thou shalt not make for yourself an idol and thou shalt not bow down to it. So they were going to place God's law higher than civil legislation in spite of the possible penalty. Now the first commandment of God reads, I am the Lord thy God, 
which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Has this law been tampered with? Well, we're not going to look at the Roman Catholic version tonight. We're going to look at international law and see whether this law has been made void. Here is the 1983 issue of The Humanist, and it says, I'm convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects the spark of what theologians call divinity in every human being. We are evolving towards divinity. That's what humanism teaches. Of course, the Bible teaches that there is only one God. These teachers must embody the same selfless dedication as the most rabid fundamentalist preacher. For they will be ministers of another sort utilizing a classroom instead of a pulpit to convey humanist values in whatever subject they teach, regardless of the educational level, preschool, daycare, or large state university. The classroom must and will become an arena for conflict between the old and the new. Now, I've been in the education system most of my life, and I have seen this change, and I've seen the turmoil that it has co caused. The rotting corpse of Christianity, together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith of humanism, resplendent in its promise of a world in which the never-realized Christian ideal of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. It will undoubtedly be a long, arduous, painful struggle replete with much sorrow and many tears, but humanism will emerge triumphant. It must if the family of humankind is to survive. Fascinating. You see, we cannot afford in our society today to have superiority of one religion over another religion. There must be a universal soup religion where all flow together in one homogenized religion. Otherwise, we will always have the basis for conflict. This is their reasoning. And their reasoning is not unreasonable. It's just wrong. <laughs> That's all. Because what if there is only one religion? Then you have a problem. What if the Bible is right when it says, there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved except the name Christ Jesus? What if it is right? Well, then it's just a statement of fact and not unreasonable to say that the one is better than the other. Did you know that the Bible predicts precisely when the Messiah would come? That the Bible is so precise about this issue that whole religious systems negate it and push it aside and even forbid its study lest one should discover the Messiah? And so this is a very important question. What does legislation do these days with the first commandment? Is there a law in the world which is called hate speech? Yes or no? Yes. And one of the parameters of hate speech is to say that one religion is superior to another. And in the school systems, that which we have read, is it being implemented? Has it been implemented by legislation? Or is the status quo of the old system still in vogue? The new system is in vogue. What must children be taught in our school systems? There is no longer such a thing as religious instruction as it was in the old days. Today, you have comparative religion as a study and each child has to be exposed to all the religions plus all their rituals be able to say their prayers 
And it is wrong to say that one religion is superior to another. So by international legislation, United States human rights legislation, the law now reads, you shall regard all other gods as equal to me. Isn't that what the law says these days? By law? Isn't that how our children are trained? Let's have a look. Let's have a look at the news releases. Let's have a look at the battle behind the scenes. This is the Christian institution, the Christian influence in the secular world. New equality laws substantially restrict religious liberty. Today, Friday, this is in England, the government closes its consultation on radical anti-discrimination laws which substantially restrict the freedom of churches and religious bodies to employ staff who are practicing believers. Because by this very act, you are saying that your religion is exclusive. No, we need a universal soup-religion. As I've said before, that means that you should be compelled to employ people from another religion so that you don't have this exclusivity anymore. Top, top legal academics have today accused the government of undermining religious freedom. They say the government has decided to implement a EU employment directive without granting the full range of safeguards which are permitted under EU law. All religious faiths will be affected. Professor Ian Lee of Durham University, a leading human rights lawyer, said today, the government regulations have all the potential to seriously undermine freedom of association for religious people. That they place the modern concept of equality over and above religious liberty. This is not a war that is a storm in a teacup. This is an international law. I have seen it in the universities where I have taught how our theology departments have been replaced with departments of religious studies. I've seen it how laws have been changed so that the name of Jesus may not be invoked even in public places. The second commandment reads, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Remember, this is the commandment that Rome removed. Why? Because if this commandment remains in place, you will never unite all the religions into a universal soup because they all practice idolatry. So it's easier to change one religion than to change all of them. Let's have a look at the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, Article 1161. And uh, this is the Catechism which reinforces the Seventh Ecumenical Council of Nicaea on images, and it reads as follows. Following the divinely inspired teaching of our holy fathers and the traditions of the Catholic Church, well I've added there, there's no mention of following the divinely inspired teachings of the Bible here. We're talking about the divinely inspired holy fathers and traditions. We rightly define with full certainty and correctness, I wonder based on what? reason and common sense, natural law, of course, that, like the figure of the precious and life-giving figure of the cross, venerable and holy images of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, our inviolate lady, the holy mother of God, and the venerated angels, all the saints and the just, whether painted or made of mosaic or another suitable material, are to be exhibited in the holy churches of God on sacred vessels and vestments, walls and panels, on houses and on streets. Boom. Thus says another Lord God. But not the Lord God of heaven. So here we have a law 
which totally negates the law of God and hates speech, implements it on a universal level. Because if you were to say something against it, you are practicing this hate speech. Please note, I'm not saying anything against it, I'm just reading it. Some people try to make some of the occultic symbols into Christian symbols. Such as saying that the pentagram represents the five wounds of Christ. Or that the triangle is a symbol of the Trinity. And so you can get all of these things. I want to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 4. It says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of a male or a female, the likeness of a beast that is in the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And if we carry on in chapter, the seven, Deuteronomy, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest they be, they be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. That's pretty straight language, wouldn't you think so? Why would God be so adamant about this issue? Because anything that is by touch is no longer by faith. And if I need something to anchor myself, it's no longer by faith. Faith is a relationship. It's a relationship. Well, I'm taking you to the south of Germany, to this magnificent edifice where the presidents of the world get together, and I'll show you some of the symbols on the doors of the Marian shrine in this uh, Catholic enclave. And here on the doors you have the symbols of the zodiac, and the doorknob is a beautiful yin-yang. So all the signs of the Aquarius over here, most of them are used in occultism all the time. And uh, why would they put the yin-yang there? I mean, what's that got to do with Catholicism? And what are all these signs of astrology doing over there? Isaiah 47 verse 13 says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly pro Gnosticators, stand up and save thee from the things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame, and it shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. This is no comfortable fire we're talking about here. All these stargazers and prognosticators and monthly uh, foretellers, fortune tellers, the Bible doesn't have much time for them. It says, take the word of God as it stands. Believe his prophets and you will be established. But this sort of thing should not be the vogue of a Christian. And here it is all over this cathedral. Now what does this yin-yang mean? Let's just have a look at some of the laws regarding the yin-yang. There are seven laws concerning yin-yang. One of them is law number two which reads, everything changes. That's fascinating. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Isn't that right? Whereas this law says we have to change, and if the times change, we have to adapt and we have to change. No, Jesus Christ hasn't changed. The second law, uh, another law is law number three at least, it says all antagonisms are complementary. Hmm. This would make Jesus and Satan complementary to each other. That's very interesting. Number six says the extreme of any condition will produce signs of the opposite. 
If you apply this to Christ, this would mean that he is the extreme in goodness, mercy, compassion, etc., that he will produce signs of hate, injustice, unconcern, etc. This also would mean Satan can eventually become kind, loving, obedient, and so forth. And the Bible says, Woe unto them that call good evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. So today, we are living under these signs of change. And we are being driven by United Nations legislation to go along with this change. So the first law of God has been negated publicly by universal legislation. It's gone. The second one falls in the same category. It's gone. Hate legislation is higher than God's law. What about the third commandment? By the way, when is God going to act? When they have made void thy law. Well, they're doing a pretty good job. Let's see how far they get. Third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of, thy Lord, of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Now there are whole groups today who believe that we have the name wrong. We should actually return to the Hebrew name. And then you know, we should get it right, exactly how it was. Is God concerned with pronunciation or character development? I don't believe there is any such thing as salvation by pronunciation. Because then we would have a problem on this planet. <laughs> but I'll deal with that in another lecture. So let's not talk about the actual name and how you say it and how you pronounce it because that has nothing to do with a moral character. That is a, a detail, a side issue. When it comes to the name of God, we are dealing with the character of God. You know, we talk about character assassination, defamation of character. In Afrikaans, that is namskendung, which means to go against that which your name stands for. So you have this word name in there. It's very nice. So character assassination. So you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, you know, there's a whole body of people who take the name of the Lord upon themselves. They call themselves Christians, don't they? And if you take the name of Christian upon yourself and you don't live up to the name Christian, are you then taking the name of the Lord your God in vain, yes or no? Yes, don't call yourself a Christian if you don't want to live by it. Call yourself whatever you like but not a Christian. Now, this is also the law of blasphemy, obviously. Obviously, you're not supposed to blaspheme God, and that means to drag his character in the mud, or to say that that which pertains only to God can also pertain to me or to anyone else. That would also be taking the name of your Lord in vain. John 10, 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Mark 2, verse 7, why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? There are two definitions in the Bible of what blasphemy is. Elevating yourself to the level of God and saying that you have the power that God has to forgive sins. Now, there are two ways in which you can do this. <laughs> it's fascinating. 
And the whole New Age movement is involved. The New Age movement elevates man to the position of God. And very often perfectionism brings God down to the level of man. So you have the reverse coin of a very similar situation. The one group being extremely liberated and the other group being conservative to the extreme, basically doing exactly the same thing. So let's be careful that we don't fall into either of those two categories because Satan loves extreme. He is the father of this dualism, the sending two theories into the world diametrically opposed to each other. Both of them on the wrong side of the fence. He does it beautifully in politics, have you noticed? <laughs> you always have to vote between two extremes and you never know, is, the, is it the pot or the kettle you're voting for? Well, Revelation 13 verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast ride out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Here it talks about the papal system in Revelation 13. For those who don't know about this, there's a DVD of mine which is called Two Beasts Become Friends. It's about Revelation 13, and you can look at that. So here is this blasphemous power, which is the papal power, because the same criteria in Revelation 13 we find in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn power. Verse 6 it says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. So he blasphemes the tabernacle and his name, the character of God. And the tabernacle stands for the plan of salvation. He blasphemes the plan of salvation. How does he do that? Does he perhaps place someone else in the place of the role of the mediator? Does he provide another way in which you can climb into heaven? The Bible says if anyone climbs in by some other way than through the door, and the door is Christ. I am the door, and you have to go through me. Otherwise, you don't come in. The thief climbs in some other way. Daniel 7.25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. He is a pompous fellow. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the Vicar of God. Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. He certainly qualifies. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, Pope Leo XIII. God himself is obligated to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Dignities and duties of the priest, volume 12, page 27. Certainly qualifies as a blasphemous power. And if you speak against it legally, could it be classified as hate speech? Well, yes. So I'm not going to speak about it. I'm just reading it. <laughs> I'm not saying it. They're saying it. Here is another one. The poor sinner kneels at the confessor's feet. He knows he is not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. He hears the words, I absolve thy sins, and thy, the hideous load of sin drops from him, from his soul forever. Good grief. Well, there you have it. Here is a power that assumes both the prerogatives of God and the prerogative to forgive sin. And you may not speak a word against it because if you do, you could just be classified as a terrorist. That would be nice. You could end up in some orange little suit with a short chain between your legs. Could just happen. Revelation 2 verse 9 says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And here, the word Christian was not yet invoked because that was only later that they started calling the Christians at Antioch. Christendom was a Jewish sect, if you like, 
So he's talking about Christians. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Christians, believers in the Messiah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Matthew 15, 9 says, In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. These are important issues. Now, this is not only to do with Catholicism. If we look at the me methods and the modern methodology in all Christian denominations, and I'll be dealing with that in a later lecture, we will see that the same basic principles have been introduced into virtually every denominational field in the world. It's horrendous. The law of God is being made void by practice and by legislation, and it's being enforced. Now, if using the Lord's name in vain is blasphemous, how much more so preventing and forbidding its use? Forbidden to pray in the name of Jesus. Testing the faith. Clergy to protest at White House will ask Bush to reverse policy limiting chaplain's prayers. A group of clergy is planning to gather outside the White House today to ask President Bush to nullify military poli policies that forbid chaplains from praying in Jesus' name. According to a statement from the National Clergy Council, Christian leaders from various denominations will hold a new conference outside Lafayette Park, just north of the White House, to protest what the groups call an escalating crisis over chaplain prayer policies. Now, is this only a United States issue? Are these laws suddenly just appearing here in the North American continent? No. They are universal. In my country... You may not pray in the name of Jesus in a public venue. So you may not play, pray in a stadium. You may not pray this name in a multicultural school setting. And you may not pray it in Parliament. Parliament was always opened with a prayer. No longer. I had one of the professors at my university talking to me, crying. He said, all these years I could open in prayer and now I may not even name the name of my God. It's all gone by legislation. Well, you know, it's, it's an affront to someone of another religion if all of a sudden we invoke the name of Jesus. But are they allowed to invoke their deities? Oh, absolutely no problem. No problem talking about Buddha or any one of the others. No problem whatsoever. So it seems the third commandment is being internationally eradicated by universal legislation. What about the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter. Thy manservant nor thy maidservant. Nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see. And all that in the is and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1957, page 15. Okay, so we're not keeping the Lord's Day we're keeping the Catholic day, which they call the Lord's day, without one doctrinal, one verse in favor of their argument. Let's see what the Reformers used to say. Let's go back to the Reformation. Melanchthon, the meek and mild friend of Martin Luther's, quoting on Daniel 7 verse 25, and the spelling is not wrong, this is just old English, he writes, he, talking about Antichrist, he changes the times and laws 
that any of the six work days commanded of God will make them unholy and idle days when he lists. So if the Pope wants to, he can change a work day into a holy day. We call it that this day still, don't we? Don't we talk about a holiday? Good. Or of their own holy days abolished, make work days again. So if they want to change it around, they can do it. God says, six days shalt you labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Roman Catholic Church can change it around. Or when they changed ye Saturday into Sunday, they have changed God's laws, turned them into their own traditions to be kept above God's precepts. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic record, September 1, 1923. So they say, we change the Sabbath by our authority. And we will determine on what day you will rest. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday. And thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Baal, or Balder, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus. Catholic Mara, March 1894. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. Cardinal Gibbons, in faith of our fathers. They go even further. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Father Enright, American Sentinel, 1893. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage which warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Catholic Press, Sydney. This one's really arrogant. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. This is... Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Catholic Church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. This is fascinating. And then they throw out the gauntlet. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. Choose. And that is why there is this move to reintroduce Sunday. Pope launches crusade to save Sunday in 1998. He wrote this encyclical, Dies Domini, where he refers to his favorite little article. You remember that one? I spoke about it last night. Rerum Nuvarum. He likes that one, or he liked it. And then he says, therefore also in the particular circumstances of our time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Well, I thought I'd choose a web page in accordance with the country where I'm speaking. <laughs> so I went to workersrights.ca, which stands for Canada. Yes. Work time, weekly rest, and Sunday closing. Each week, workers are entitled to a day off to rest and relax and pursue leisure activities. Well, which day is that, do you think? Sunday. 
Now, there is no law yet which says that you may not. In some countries, they have just in Croatia decided to introduce that law that you may not. And some of the laws in Europe are changing. And certain of the big trade unions have managed to shut down mega stores on Sunday. That has happened. But it's interesting that mega stores and malls have legislation that forbids closure on the Sabbath day. You're not allowed to close on a Saturday. You may close on a Sunday. But the law in most countries has not yet been enforced. So here is a hanging law. The Pope has asked for civil legislation to ensure that Sunday is kept. Sunday is the international banking rest day and civil legislation forces employers to pay double if they have to work on Sunday. Here's a hanging law. Law number one, law number two, law number three, gone by international human rights legislation. Law number four, pending, hanging. It's been asked for, it's being agitated, they're asking for it. And uh, here's the whole story on Sunday. You can read it as your leisure. But the Pope was quite adamant about it. Pope John Paul II said in the Detroit News, a person who violates the sanctity of Sunday is to be punished as a heretic. That's marvelous. What was the punishment for a heretic? <coughs> Sizzle fits. That was the punishment. I wonder whether they want to be that hectic. Well, we'll see. Sunday Mass should seen, be seen as a joy, says the Pope, present Pope. We can't live without it, he tells crowded Angulus. Sunday Mass is not an imposition, but a joy and a need for Catholics, says Benedict. He's asking more and more and more and more about it. Then they brought out this magnificent 2003 declaration. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath Saturday to Sunday. And that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings on, on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. Now we know that there are many Christian apologists who say, no, we can find it in the Bible. I mean, the disciples gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread, and then they say, there it is. What does the Roman Catholic Church say about such theological uh, exegesis? What do they say about that? They say it's dishonest. Because you will read further and you will see they gather together on every single day. And when Paul gathered together on the first day of the weeds, all the lights were on. Why? Because it was after hours, after the Sabbath. He had a church meeting. Poor old Eutychus couldn't stand. He's droning and droning and droning, fell asleep. And I gather some people here also fall asleep from, from my droning. <laughs> And he fell from the window. Remember that story? Actually a support of the Sabbath rather than the support of a Sunday because on the daylight he had to march and walk kilometers far on the venerable day of the sun. So the Catholic Church is right. It's dishonest to argue that the change can be found in the Bible. But their big beef is that it's a denial of their authority. They say it will be so and it will be so. Here we have this interesting floating law. But it's nice to see how they argue this issue. So today we have groups of people who come to the conclusion that because we are keeping another day, therefore we don't have to live in accordance to the law of God. And some go so far as to say the law of God has been nailed to the cross. Now I'd like you to think about that for a while. The law of God has been nailed to the cross. We are living under grace. By grace you are saved. That's true. 
and not by works, lest you should boast. Therefore they say the law is gone. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. We uphold the law. So here we have this interesting dichotomy. By the way, if you are under grace, what does that mean? When you are under grace. When you are under grace, you are being pardoned. Pardoned for what? For transgression of the law. Paul says where there is no law, there is no transgression. Okay, let's do away with the law. There is no law. Do I then need grace? No. Because without law, there's no transgression. Without transgression, I need no grace. So grace and law are complementary. And if you separate them, then you have need of neither. The two have to be together. Here is the theology of the modern world. These are the great Pentecostal leaders, and uh, they have written books on this issue. Uh, the Promise of Christ's Return, this book is called, and these are the leading figures within these churches. They write, The Old Covenant was annulled with the betrayal of Judas, page 158. Well, let's not even go there. Those who still try to keep the law are not spiritually of age and have not yet received the Holy Spirit. If the law is still read these days, it must be for people that are not of age, that is, for unbelievers. This is the only sense in which the law is still applicable today. Believers live through the Spirit and not under the law, quoting Galatians 5.25. Believers that try to keep the law are in slavery. But believers that live in the fullness of the new covenant are free. Therefore, it is dangerous for believers in the church period to be associated with the law. Churches that read the Ten Commandments on Sunday in the assembly bring their members under the impression that they are still under the law and that they must try to keep the law. Christians who today try to keep the Ten Commandments hinder the work of the Holy Spirit and undermine the pure essence of the new covenant. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here we have a dichotomy. Here we have a problem. So do we want to steal to be Christians? Do we want to lie to be Christians? Here is a televangelist who has swallowed this theology hook, line, and sinker. So what does he do about it? Let's watch him and listen to him. No more! 
first thing attacking that dragon was given. Done. Wow, he calls it a dragon. And he chopped that first thing. And he takes the law of God and he breaks it over his knee and he says, No more! And then he takes the pot of manna, which stands for the body of Christ, that will always be in an uncorrupted state, and he smashes it. He takes the rod of Aaron, which stands for my high priest, who intercedes on my behalf, breaks it, throws it away. I believe the poor man is just deceived. I don't think he understands the plan of salvation. But that's the extreme of the theology, where it eventually leads. And uh, it's rather sad. Matthew 7.22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And this work Iniquity is the Greek anomia, which means the condition without law because of ignorant of it, because of violating it. Contempt and violation of the law. Iniquity, anomia. So this question of anomia is not a new theology. It's an old theology that has been rearing its head over and over and over again. Today, whoo, it's fashionable. Do away with the law. But when you say, are you happy with being clobbered over the head to get what's in your pocket? Are you happy when they hijack you to get your car? Are you happy when your children and your daughters are raped? Are you happy when people are killed for a cell phone? Are you happy about... No, 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 that's not what we mean. Well, what do you mean? Eventually it always boils down to the Sabbath, doesn't it? They're not keeping it, so they must find a reason to get rid of it. And what better way to get rid of it than to get rid of the whole law? Then you've gotten rid of it. But what have you got? You've got anarchy. Where no law is, there is no transgression. Where there is no transgression, there is no need for grace. Therefore, grace without law is a misnomer. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by keeping the law. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans three nineteen and 20. The law only tells us what, what is right and wrong. And it condemns us when I look in the mirror of the law. I say, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips living amongst the people of unclean lips. Who shall save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. There is someone who can do it. I'm saved by grace and grace alone. But he wants me to come back into harmony with the law. Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Magnificent when you study this theology. The war is about the law. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Romans 7.12, don't get rid of God's law. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are under the law, but under grace? God forbid. I don't want to become a transgressor of God's law because I'm under grace. I want to say thank you for saving me from this body of death. Help me to clobber the old man to death every time he tries to stand up. You're not going to be perfect. And you're going to fall and you're going to slip and you're going to slide. And if you're going to look for, to, at me for perfection, I suggest you go and chat to my wife quietly somewhere. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Let's eat the word. Let's eat it. Let's eat the living manna that never rots. Not throw it away. John 14, 6, 
Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the high priest. Let's not break the staff of Aaron and throw it away and say no more. We're dead if we do that. Psalm 119, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. How can you crush the truth over your foot and throw it away? Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. Law and grace are two sides of a coin. There's the law in the New Testament. They like to say the new covenant annuls the law. The law is no more. It is an old covenant. It is a Jewish law. It's not a Jewish law. It's a universal law. Every single one of the Ten Commandments you'll find in the New Testament. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and Him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10, Revelation 19.10. You can go through every single one of the laws of God and you will find them in the New Testament. There's no such thing as the law having been done away with. But this theology, this antinomianism, this having done away with the law of God is an old thing. Martin Luther already fought against it. And since we're talking about rekindling the Reformation, let's get back to the roots and away from this terrible confusion. Antinomians believe that Christians are free from the laws, Greek nomos, or morality by virtue of God's grace. Critics charged antinomians with licentious living, apparently popular amongst Gnostic sects. Antinomianism was revived amongst the Anabaptists by Johann Agricola, a one-time student of Martin Luther. So here was an Anabaptist. You know, they had so much truth, these Anabaptists, and then they allowed this fanaticism to come into their ranks, and they hooped and howled and rolled and laughed. You know, it sounds like what's happening today. Who retracted his position after arguments with Luther and Luther's associate, Philip Melanchthon. Antinomianism was held by members of various sects during the British Commonwealth, and it's being held by various people today. He is one of the fathers of modern antinomianism. His name was John Nelson Darby. And he had an interesting theology. He comes from what is known as the Plymouth Brethren. He originated in Dublin, Ireland, about the year 1830. Darby, a clergyman in the Church of England, renounced the church and assumed that all existing church organizations are detriment to Christianity. We don't need an organization. Who implemented organization? Who set up elders and deacons and all of these? This is God-given. God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. And if everybody is saying, I'm being led by the Spirit hither, and the other one is being led by the Spirit thither, by the end you have the confusion we have in the world today. And obstructive with regeneration in the spiritual life. It was obstructive. Get rid of the church, he said. Moreover, they were confirmed antinomians. Mr. Darby would say, this is how far he went. If any man had anything to do with the law of God, even to obey it, he was a sinner by the very act. Wow. Of course, they strenuously antagonized inwrought and personal holiness as an utter impossibility, since the old man had a lease of the soul which does not expire till death. Yet they insist that they are perfectly holy in Christ up there, while perfectly carnal and corrupt down here in their moral state. This is religious confusion at its very best. Mr. Darby, speaking to the writer of this article, way back, so this is 120 years old, said, Jesus does not walk about in heaven dropping off fingers and toes, referring to the body of Christ, which is falling away. It follows that every believer once incorporated into Christ is absolutely sure of ultimate salvation. Once saved, always saved. What's the Bible say about that? The Bible says if the righteous man turns from his righteousness and does what he's what? 
wrong, sinful in the eyes of the Lord, none of his former righteousness will be remembered. And if the unrighteousness, unrighteous man turns from his unrighteousness and does what is right in the sight of the law, none of his former unrighteousness shall be remembered. He shall certainly live. So there's no such thing in the Bible. The certainty is forever beyond contingencies. No act of sin, even murder, can remove us from our standing in Christ. Sin may obstruct communion and leave the soul in sadness and darkness for a season, but since, as Shakespeare says, all is well that ends well, sin in a believer is well since it ends in eternal life. Well, Mr. Darby, that's an interesting theology. This is the theology of the so-called Plymouth Brethren examined. Now, any sane man will say that that's ludicrous. So you're on the one hand in the world today, you have the antinomianism, smashing the law, getting rid of it, we're free. And then you have people saying, now hang on a second, that's ridiculous. Surely the law of God can't be gone. And so you have mega movements in the world saying, let's bring the law of God back. Can you see the two poles that we have in the world today? So we have the foundation for moral law. In 2003, Chief Justice Moore was removed from his position for standing for the inalienable right to acknowledge God. The former Chief Justice lectures throughout the United States teaching about America's history and our right to acknowledge God. And he serves as the chairman of the Foundation for Moral Law in Montgomery, Alabama. Here we go. Let's get the law back. And he writes this book, So Help Me God, by Judge Roy Moore, describes the providential events in Chief Justice Moore's life leading up to his removal from office, as well as providing a thorough explanation of separation of church and state and the true rule of law. The argument was, can the law be portrayed in a court of law or is that against the new law which supersedes God's law which says uh, that this is discriminatory it, uh, it basically is hate speech because you're elevating one set of morals over another so over